Cool. Okay, uh, let's get started. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming along, um, especially just to my friends who uh, decided just to come on a whim. Um, cool. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, just in terms of what we'll be doing today, I'll just be going over kind of the whole presentation in general, because um, I know some of you haven't actually known anything about what I'm doing. So um, hopefully this shouldn't take too much time off the actual last part presentation. Um, yeah, so we'll be looking at a recap of just like what exactly I'm doing. Uh, we'll be looking at what I've done over the original first two terms. Uh, we'll be looking at what we're doing or what I've done this term and then kind of just bringing it all together and figuring out, you know, how exactly, uh, what did anything I do actually address what I was trying to achieve in the first place. Um, and so hopefully this presentation will be more about the results than, um, sorry, less about the results and more about the actual question um, that we'll see. Um, of course, there's a lot of things that I've done throughout the presentation and I can't wait to actually talk about that. Um, but before we do that, I think, yeah, let's just go over, you know, what have I been doing? Um, so my topic has been pretty much about, you know, IoT, Internet of Things security, and uh, just about, you know, how can we be sure that what something has saying it's doing is actually doing what it says it's doing. Um, so there are a lot of IoT devices and brands out there. Um, you see, you know, if you go on eBay and search for like smart light, there's so many brands, so many models, stuff like that. Um, oh no, my tab does not work. There we go. Okay. Um, and yeah, why are there so many? So a lot of these products are actually what we call white label products. Um, in other words, you buy it from someone and you kind of change the name, you change the image, you change the model, and then you kind of sell it off to the customer um, saying that, hey, this is my product, um, you know, buy it from me because my one is better for some reason, even though it's not really your product because you just bought it off someone else and renamed it. Um, so I guess pros and cons. So the pros is that you use someone else's code, so you don't have to write it yourself and you have a really fast profit turnaround. Um, and this is a big thing, especially for, you know, companies that want to get their foot in the door to say, hey, use our product instead of other people's because, you know, we can sell you the product really fast um, and we have fast support, stuff like that. Now, in terms of the cons, um, just like the pros, I guess, um, you're using someone else's code. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, I'm not really answering that in this specific um, thesis, but, you know, that's just for you to think about. Um, but one of the big issues with using someone else's code is, of course, um, security vulnerabilities such that you don't really know what exactly is in the code because you have, you know, an opaque view of what's going on. And so therefore, you know, if there is a vulnerability, you don't know your product is affected and other people's products are also affected if they use that same um, code, same products, stuff like that. Cool. Um, so yeah, one big thing with, um, with IoT devices is that they're all centralized. Um, and this is a good thing in most cases because it's so much easier to actually deploy, manage, you know, send off these devices um, compared to this idea of decentralized web. Um, when realistically, even though it's decentralized, there's still some sort of, you know, centralization somewhere along the lines of actually getting things working. Um, and one of the big cons with trying to do this decentralization thing is, um, oh, sorry, a con of having a centralized thing is if this main system goes down, everything goes down. Um, and also again, because one single place is receiving all the information, uh, we don't really know what they're doing with the information, if they're storing it, what they're doing with it, if they are storing it. Um, so there's little transparency about what's actually going on. Um, and other things just to consider is the fact that, you know, a company could remotely issue a firmware upgrade. They could tell a device, hey, do this. Um, and you wouldn't really know what's going on um, unless we have a look at it. So um, that's kind of what my thesis is about. So my thesis that I'm trying, thesis statement that I'm trying to address is how have manufacturers of IoT or smart home devices addressed increasing concerns of digital privacy and product security um, in specific case with the Roborock vacuum cleaner that I'll be talking about in a second. Um, so breaking it down into digital privacy. So we'll just be looking at the nature of the network data, how it's used, uh, how frequent it's used, where it's being sent um, and the product security as well, just to investigate any vulnerabilities into, you know, what's wrong with the code, what's wrong with the program, if there is any. Um, and also to see, you know, how has Roborock kind of addressed these security issues to see, you know, we know that there's an issue, how are we going to fix it? Because um, I think that's a really big thing that's testament to if a, you know, device or if a manufacturer is actually, you know, good to use is if they actually reply to, you know, customer complaints. I think I missed a slide. Yes, I did. Okay, so um, the device in scope is the Roborock S6 vacuum cleaner on my right here. Um, yeah, so it was released in 2019 and uh, Roborock itself was a independent company that uh, Xiaomi originally kind of endorsed to build a vacuum cleaner. 
Um, and then they have since kind of made their own devices after becoming successful with the very first vacuum cleaner, which was the uh, Xiaomi vacuum cleaner, I think released in 2017. Um, this specific vacuum cleaner has both integrations to Tuya and Xiaomi, which are two really big um, IoT infrastructure frameworks, I guess. Um, and pretty much all the products that we've seen that I've shown in these slides here, uh, they all say Tuya somewhere within the product descriptions. Um, so you kind of know that's pretty big, especially the one on the left, I think, Richard, you can see that light bulb just now there um, and over there as well. Cool. Okay. So um, yeah, it looks pretty good according to reviews. It's got like 4.5 stars, I think, out of five. Um, but is it that safe? That's what we'll be looking at today. Cool. Um, so hopefully this will be a really quick just buzz through of thesis A and B. Um, what did we do in the original first term? Um, so to get started, I took apart the device, many, many screws. Let's go to the next one. Um, and we try to figure out how do we actually get access to the device? So um, pulling apart the device, we get the hardware and we can eventually find that there are three uh, pins, pads, whatever you want to call them, uh, which eventually gives us some UART or serial access to the console, uh, which is great for us, except we realize that there is a password that we need to get in. So unfortunate. Um, although, of course, uh, looking inside the actual, you know, how the program works, uh, we find that it's using U-Boot, which is a very common uh, embedded uh, bootloader for embedded devices. Um, and after some fiddling around finding some files, we see that there's a file called Vinda, um, and it contains some sort of string, uh, which just so happens that if you X or each character with the number seven, I think, um, we end up getting some password um, in plain text. And if we paste that in, we do get access to a show, which is great. Um, that's what I did for thesis A. Uh, thesis B, which was last term, that's where I did the bulk of my work. Uh, what do we do? Firstly, after we have access, you know, we want to do some offline or static access so we can actually get, you know, the contents of the thing. Um, and I don't really want to analyze things while it's actually live, just in case it backfires on me or blows up maybe, who knows. Uh, so dump it, make it sure it's offline, do some static analysis. Um, so just grabbing it off, um, this is just some random computer that I had lying around just in case something went wrong. Um, and so, yeah, just copying off all the firmware images and stuff like that. Uh, so I guess it is useful to mention that there are many different ways to do it. Um, I just chose to do it over SSH and DD because I don't have the hardware to actually extract the firmware from the chips because that's expensive. Um, moving on. So now looking at actually what's going on in the system, just a few fingerprinting version verifications. Uh, we see that everything is running as root, which is kind of a red flag whenever we talk about, you know, least privileged access. Um, moving on, we saw that the recovery partition is modifiable. And what that means for us is that, you know, if I was malicious, I could uh, modify the recovery partition, which is what gets used to restore if you need to do a factory reset. Um, so if I reset that partition, put something bad, I could plant like a backdoor or something. And so even if you factory reset the device, uh, you would have access to the device, uh, which isn't good. Um, Talking about network capturing, so looking through the packet captures and just playing around with the device as usual, uh, we see that when we actually try to pair the device, um, it just has the password and the network ID, um, SSID in plain text, uh, which is a pretty bad thing. Um, one thing later which I wanted to mention is that um, there are white papers from the company Tuya and Xiaomi, which both talk about you know, not having plain text transmission during pairing. Um, and it's kind of funny to see that, you know, this product, which is, you know, using their services, isn't really paying attention to their own guidelines and specifications, um, which is kind of questionable as opposed to like, you know, are you actually implementing or making sure that your customers, your clients, whoever's using your framework is actually, you know, following your security protocols and guidelines like that. Uh, looking at the ports, uh, we see that we have, so just uh, using Netstat to look at any listening um, ports or services, uh, we see that there is an SSH port as well as port 6668, uh, not too important. But the main thing is that there is SSH on the device, which could be useful for later. Um, it is firewall though, which is pretty good, except for the fact that we can turn off the firewall, um, which makes it not as good. Um, in this specific slide, I just wanted to mention that you can get a remote access um, and you can use something like zero tier, which is kind of like a VPN um, to always get access. So even if someone else connects it to the home network, I give it to someone else, um, I can still SSH into it um, just because that port is open and because I can have some sort of persistent access. Um, and then just moving on, before I finish up with, I think this part C, our uh, part B is um, 
For some reason, TCP dump is installed into a vacuum cleaner. Um, TCP dump, if people don't know, pretty much it can just listen to the uh, network interface and whatever packets are being passed around or that it detects, uh, it just stores it in a PCAP file um, for who knows what, triaging, uh, snooping, who knows, stuff like that. So it's just interesting to see that, you know, there's rsync, which is a file synchronization program, ccrypt, which is encryption. I mean, that's okay. Uh, but really just TCP dump, why does a vacuum cleaner need that? Um, we'll have a look at that in a bit later. And we are not done yet, never mind. Um, looking at rrlogd, which is the logging daemon, which just sends off the log information to the internet. Uh, we saw that from just previous um, thesis parts that it's encrypted, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and it originally used a symmetric key, which wouldn't be good because if you get hold of that key, then anyone can decrypt it. Uh, but now it is using a asymmetric key, so that's a bit better. Um, and the main takeaway from this program was the fact that you know it could unblock port 22, um, just looking at Binary Ninja. And that's probably not a good thing. Why does a logging program need to open SSH? I mean, there's surely a reason, but who knows? Um, and finally, looking at the ADB client, which is the Android debugging bridge. There's a USB port on top of the vacuum cleaner um, to actually interface with it. Uh, how do we use it? Not really sure because it is a custom version and you can't just run normal commands without some sort of authentication. Um, okay, so that was A and B done. Let's go over to, I guess, thesis C and where we actually left off. So from thesis B, I guess just talking about the timeline, uh, what we tried to finish was to finish analyzing the firmware binaries to compare it against a stock version of Ubuntu. Um, I should mention that the old versions of the vacuum cleaner actually just ran Ubuntu 14, um, I guess for cost saving measures rather than actually cutting it down. Uh, we will see later in this presentation that they have decided to move away from that, I guess. Uh, less to do with security, more to do with just making it more of an embedded product that's actually stable because there's a lot of crashes historically with this old version. Um, and also I just wanted to check if IP version 6 was an issue because last time um, there, was a, uh, there wasn't an IP tables blocking rule uh, which allowed anyone to access it if you connected via IP version 6. Um, during the upgrade, they did disable IP version 6, so that's a good thing there. Um, now moving on to at the full privacy bit of thesis C, uh, we just had a look at the network traffic analysis to see what is it doing and like what information is it sending. Um, that was a mixture of hooking into the functions, so kind of like modifying the binaries to uh, exfiltrate where the information got logged, as well as just looking at log files because the system has a lot of those. Um, and then also trying to upgrade to the latest version and hoping we don't get locked out, which we did, but anyway. Um, and just to compare what files change between uh, version upgrades. And then also finally, just to reset the device and see what device, what files get kept. Um, and if there's anything that could potentially be an issue, if we pass on the device to a new owner, um, can they see anything that was once mine? Cool. Uh, so speaking of ADB, which is that Android debugging bridge, uh, what I did find was just a way to actually run any command, even though you're not meant to. Um, so it turns out that there's an issue in the, I guess, program, how uh, it just takes in any command here. Um, it actually whitelists what you can execute, uh, but by the magic of shell and uh, command expansion or whatever it's called, uh, you can actually still run your own commands, which probably isn't an intended purpose of it. Um, but I found out that that is an issue. So I'll probably be telling them um, sometime in the future and just let them know that they should probably fix it. So uh, what's modified, I guess, um, compared to a normal an Android debugging bridge, um, they have an interface to perform some extra commands, UART test. So that's harmless. It's just um, connects to the coprocessor inside of the vacuum cleaner to make sure um, that all of the sensors and stuff like that to actually do vacuum cleaning things work. Um, and Ruby Flash, which is what I can only assume is some sort of upgrade thing via USB, as opposed to pulling apart the device and actually doing that. Um, so in terms of how to actually use this modified version, um, there is a dynamic challenge and response. Um, and in order to do that, you need to know um, the password, which is that XOR with the value seven thing, as well as the device ID, uh, which is trivial enough to obtain. Um, and this is how it kind of works. To actually get the challenge, you type ADB show, you put in whatever password, um, and then you just whack on Rock Robo dynamic key. It gives you a 12 letter, I think, password. Uh, and then you do some sort of 
function loop. I won't talk about it there, but it gives you some password out. And once you have that password, you have the original password, you whack on what was generated, and then you run that command. Um, so the modified binary uh, has some sort of access level implementation. So depending on what level is set, and it's in a read-only partition, so we can't actually change it. And once it was set by the you know, manufacturer, um, no one can change it. Uh, TM, I guess you can. Um, but the only way to actually allow random commands to be executed is when this access level is set to zero. Um, looking inside the actual, I guess, assembly code, uh, there's actually no way for it to actually be set to zero. So that was a bit confusing to me when I first saw it because uh, if it does detect that it's zero, it instantly sets it to one. So what I think is that they realized this was an issue in the past and then they kind of just did a check to say, if level is zero, set it to one, something like that. Um, and they just prevented certain commands that you could clearly use as a sort of command injection thing. Um, so we can't uh, do arbitrary command execution, which is a shame. So, you know, you want test? No, unfortunate. Uh, but then we did see that it gave us an error saying that this specific command isn't found. Um, and bin sh, um, hopefully we all know, is kind of like that root level system shell command. Um, and so if you can see that, then, you know, I never really mentioned bin sh anywhere in my actual code. So where is it coming from? Um, and as it turns out that there is that sort of RCE vulnerability here that you can just um, chain on some other piece of string here um, and it will execute it in bin slash sh. And so if I do some command substitution, um, it does create that hello file inside of the file system. And you can see that as I did a stat, um, I have now got an access or at least modified the directory. So we can write to the file system and we can also read from the file system. So in some contrived method to actually get at the EDC password thing, because I was getting some other issues, I uh, just base64 it and then spit it out to us as an error. Um, so error-based extraction, I guess. Um, and we do get the uh, password file, which is pretty interesting. Um, now this, I guess, exploit is kind of limited in that you still need to authenticate before to get the RCE um, vulnerability, but um, the very fact that we can still access it does give us extra reassurance that if we do get locked out, hint, hint, um, that we you know, still get a way to actually access the device um, one way or another. And it also helps, I guess, because the very fact that ADB lock isn't zero, or if it is zero, whatever it is, we can still access it. Um, so subverting the access permissions, regardless of what it is, um, is still pretty important um, just in our steps. And it could possibly still be an issue um, if someone has that admin password. Okay, so moving on to the FOMO update section of um, part C, part C of this thesis. Um, so just looking at what do they change? Um, and really the reason why I wanted to check this firmware upgrade is just to see how they have responded to previous incidents um, in security vulnerabilities or privacy issues um, and to see if their new versions still have the original issues or have they actually addressed those sorts of things uh, to make sure that you know uh, we're actually listening to your complaints and we're addressing and fixing those things. Um, so some things to note is that this specific vacuum cleaner um, originally was released in 2019, June 2019, um, and the specific model that I have was manufactured June 2020. So there's a whole year um, of possible stock version changes, um, which means that, you know, if I did a factory reset, I'm being reset to the 2020 version and not necessarily the very original version. Um, that being said, it's still okay because um, just doing a baseline comparison just to see about if they've actually responded, um, it's still sufficient for what we're doing. Um, and just to mention, not too important here, that um, the original version that I have was integrated with the Xiaomi version, whereas when I did a firmware upgrade, it kind of all just switched over to the two-year cloud version. I'm not too sure why that is, but that is just what we saw. Okay, so um, comparing the stock Ubuntu version, as I mentioned before, um, the original version of the firmware just ran Ubuntu 14. Um, why would they do that? It's easier to build, I guess, as you're trying to prototype, um, instead of developing an embedded system, doing all your build chains, compiling stuff, just whack on something that you can find, that there's plenty of information on the internet. Um, the ARM processor, just out of uh, interest, was the same processor used in the SNES console. Um, so if it can run games, it can probably clean your house, who knows? Um, yeah, so what I did is a diff check against the core OS, just to see you know, what files if they existed, um, was it possibly modified from the stock 
because if it is then we might need to take a deeper closer look into you know what exactly has changed did they plant something dodgy into it um, or is it just like a specifically custom compiled version um, so most of the files well pretty much all but one of the files uh, matched completely um, in terms of the md5 hashes so for me, that means that I don't really need to have to have a in-depth look at each binary because if it's the same as the official version, uh, I can hopefully trust that it is correct. Um, the only different file is the NTP date uh, binary. And uh, basically all that does is contact some NTP time server to get the current time and then synchronize the device time with that. Um, looking at the, I guess, binary function differential analysis, what do you want to call it? Bin diff, that's what we called it. Um, there is only a 0.36 similarity, 36% um, similarity. Um, but after a closer inspection, there really wasn't anything wrong with it. It was just a custom built version um, with a few compiler flags changed. And so nothing dodgy there, I guess. Cool. Um, now doing that firmware upgrade, um, what I didn't know is when you do an upgrade, it does like 10 upgrades in a row without telling you. Um, it says, you know, there's like a version two available. So you upgrade to version two and then it automatically upgrades to version three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, so I was kind of unaware of that, which is kind of why I got locked out. Uh, but anyway, so what we did is we upgraded from version 1.5 all the way to 2.9. Um, and in that process, we upgraded it about eight times. Um, cool. So. Looking at what's changed, this is the official change log in terms of, you know, what actually gets updated between the versions. So uh, blah, 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 multi-map, Wi-Fi connection, bug fixes, very descriptive, uh, UX fixes, optimization, something, something, something. I don't really care. What I really want to know is the changes that, you know, kind of prevent us from doing our inspection. Uh, so the very first update is um, a whole bunch of network protection stuff. So some binaries got patched to actually drop IP tables. Uh, they changed kind of like migrating away from Ubuntu. They moved over to BusyBox, which is kind of like a all-in-one jack of all trades function um, because BusyBox itself, um, I guess not security related, but just BusyBox itself is around 200 kilobytes and all the utilities that are replaced is about like 10 megabytes. Um, so reducing to this small thing is really good in terms of a vendor manufacturer of an embedded device, um, just because there's less, I guess, dependencies to worry about when you're actually trying to build a system and overall the firmware is much smaller uh, other things as well they change from an open ssh server to drop bear which is again like an embedded ssh server um, and they added in a new version of i guess a iot connection to the rr servers which is robot rock in other words the manufacturer servers um, then they also change the serial handler. So if I plug in the device to a serial UART console, um, there's a new program that's serving it, which is actually a lockdown version of whatever was originally there, uh, which did pose that issue. Uh, more updates, I don't know. At this point, I lost count of what versions were changing because it locked me out. Um, and then finally, the very last version, which we currently are, 28th of April, um, it has a new uh, connection to the server. Um, not too important, but we will look at that in a second. So getting locked out. Yes, um, I got screwed over by a bit um, when they did that firmware update because um, pretty much what happened here was that I was no longer able to actually log in as root um, to see and access the file. So at that point, I was panicking. I was like, oh, OK, what do I do now? Do I start again? Do I ask for the other vacuum cleaner and hopefully not get that again? Um, luckily, I did find a way to get around that. So all is well, I think, um, but possibly we'll see all is not well. Um, yeah, so I lost access. So what exactly happened? Um, this modified version RR login, it has a check to say, hey, are you the root user? If not, I'm just going to pretend that we're going to log you in, but then just inevitably just say no. Um, and then the other things is that uh, this Vinda file, which originally I mentioned that you do the XOR with the value 7 or 37, 37 hex 37 um, to get the root password. It no longer uses that file. It now uses a file called shadow, makes sense, um, inside of this read-only directory. Um, but the main issue for my device is because I don't actually have those files on my device. So every time it does a check, it goes, hey, do you exist? No, you don't. Panic. And so I can never get back in. Um, one can imagine probably that for newer manufactured devices, um, this file is there. So perhaps it will be okay for them. Um, but for my specific model, uh, because I was uh, because my device was manufactured before this change was there, 
I therefore no longer had that file or never had that file and therefore I was screwed over there. Um, there are ways that I finally found to get in is uh, kind of force an entry point to a shell. So looking at the original bootloader, we can actually modify how we enter it. Um, we can just spawn a shell and then we can patch some file uh, to thankfully revert back to getting a normal login shell. Uh, more details of that are somewhere on my website uh, if you care to have a look at that. Um, yeah, and this is kind of just showing that um, looking at how it works, it tries to access um, the shadow file. Uh, all of this doesn't work because it doesn't exist. And so we just get locked out and it errors out. Uh, so nothing too important here. And just proving that as well, um, I just ran it through strace. So just look at the system calls. Uh, we could see that as we try to log in, um, there's a bunch of checks that it does, which is down here somewhere. And then I don't see it actually, but uh, lo long story short, it fails and it says in it fail. Um, and so I was never actually get able to get into the uh, true branch where it actually logs me in or at least tells me the wrong password. Uh, cool. Um, so are we still using Ubuntu? I'm pretty sure we were, um, although there were some rep like big remnants like apt-get and dpkg. Um, both of those were removed. Um, so I couldn't really 100% tell if we were. Um, and a lot of the tools were replaced with BusyBox, as I mentioned before. And you can see that it saved at least 150 megabytes. So there is a purpose. It's not just that, hey, let's kick people out and restrict them from using it. It's more from a developer, from a manufacturer point of view, hey, it's easy for us to deploy this because, you know, smaller file sizes means that we need to have less storage on our servers. It means people will download it faster, update faster, faster turnaround for everyone. Um, so right now it's effectively running an embedded version of Linux. Um, so looking at other changes in terms of the firewall, I mentioned that as well. Um, there are IP6 table rules to drop requests and inbound requests, which is a good thing, which means that I can no longer, I can no longer try to SSH into it just because everything gets canceled um, with or without stuff like that. Um, and also other programs have the ability to drop SSH access. So originally only one program did, but it never actually caught it. Um, because just the way how the code was written, it never did that. Um, so they did fix it in the newer versions. So on the true case, they would allow it. But on the false case, they would deny it. Um, and then two other programs actually just immediately drop it as soon as the program starts, uh, which is a good move because you probably shouldn't be able to unblock it anyway. Uh, now talking about TCP dump, I think, yes. Um, one of the more interesting changes was that the Wi-Fi connection manager has the ability to now call TCP dump. Um, so why I would assume it's probably for debugging purposes and that would make sense. And we do find out that it does it for debugging purposes, um, but that debugging purpose is a remote instruction from a server. So hypothetically, someone could say, hey, do a debug at you know 3 a.m. for the fun of it. Um, and you wouldn't really know. Uh, so what's it actually storing and uploading when it does this debug? Uh, just DNS stuff, boring, uh, sockets and the PIDs, kind of interesting. Uh, network information stuff, blah, 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 and really just a network capture. So anything that the device can see on the wireless network, um, I guess keep in mind that uh, for a wireless device connected to an access point, it can actually see quite a lot of things as opposed to if you just plug in your laptop via an ethernet cable, um, because of how switches differ to hubs, um, an access point is a hub and therefore a hub kind of receives something and broadcasts it to everyone, whereas a switch will say, hey, who's the specific person to send it to? Um, because an access point is a hub, it means that anyone else connect to the same access point who's sending trans or transmitting data, you'd be able to see that information. Um, so potentially an issue there. Um, again, it's just limited to what a normal wireless device can actually receive. It's not really doing any man in the middle things. It's just a passive scan. Um, so what else is uploaded to the servers, I guess? Uh, we know that there's device data, application configs and logs, that's fine. The map data, which would kind of make sense. Um, and then diagnostic stuff. So there's the running processes, the configuration, uh, which we previously said that they had an insecure pairing process because you could see the password and the SSID in plain text. They should fix that. Uh, packet capture, we've seen before, and the black box, which is just statistics about how many times it's cleaned. And even when you reset the device, it kind of pertains that data. Um, so looking at the privacy policy, um, it says stuff about, where is it? Um, last 20 items will be saved by your device, stored in the server for up to 180 days. Um, and the password information is only stored on the device side. 
Um, so clearly, looking at the logs, uh, we can see that what gets uploaded to the server is our device credentials. So I'm not sure what the privacy policy is talking about there, whether they forgot or kind of undermined that policy. Um, we can see that the log data contains stuff to do with the password. And so can we really trust the privacy policies these days? Who knows? Um, that's something we also need to kind of check up on because also this privacy policy was in 2019. Three years later, I have a April 2022 version and clearly it's not matching up with what they said three years ago. Um, so that was a bit of an interesting thing there. Okay, so moving on to file persistence. So when I try to reset or upgrade the device, what kind of happens, what gets deleted, what gets kept. Uh, it turns out that for the upgrade persistence, the kind of two main things that don't get deleted are the reserve partition, which is the statistics, which is fine, and the user data, which would make sense because that contains anything from the previous version that you wouldn't really want to delete everything when you upgrade your system. So that's fine. And when we reset the device, uh, we see that everything does get deleted, which is a good thing. Um, I tried to do, let's say, photo rec and just some other data recovery to see um, once you delete or clear it, can I still retrieve it? Uh, you can't because of the way how it's flashed over. So that's a good thing. Um, and just anything in this mount reserve thing, um, which is all the statistics, black box stuff, that's kind of okay. I had a look to see if there's any like um, personal information, PII, there's nothing like that. It's just purely device sensor saying like, I've cleaned five things, I've bumped into 50 things, I fell off or flipped around 12 times, stuff like that, not too important. Um, cool, yeah, so just reasserting what I said. So the map log and user data is cleared securely, which is a good thing. Um, and what I said before, the reserve partitions or the statistics, uh, they all get kept, which is fine. Um, now, one possible thing is that because these files never get changed, but we can modify it ourselves, uh, there is a possibility that you could do some sort of symlink attack. Because um, as the you know programs write into these files, if you symlink it to some other directory, you could possibly write into another file uh, that isn't intended to be written, uh, but probably not very frequent or obvious of an attack. Um, okay, so looking into file persistence, so all files are kept between disassociations, uh, which is a bad thing. So what this means is that if I have my phone and I have the device and I press delete device from my account, nothing gets cleared, um, which is pretty bad because if you're a device owner and you're thinking, you know, I know I no longer want to use this device, let me delete it, let me give it to someone else. Um, whoever receives that device from you, all your files are still kept unless they do a factory reset. Um, and so I'm pretty sure a lot of homeowners, especially on the more layman's terms, uh, they're not going to think about doing that. So this is definitely an issue. Um, so if you do sell your device, do a factory reset. And if you do a, buy a new device, also do a factory reset. Um, also hope that it's not modified by anyone. All right, so moving into the, I think, final section is our network inspection. So looking at the behavior and just contents, what gets sent out, when does it get sent out? Um, how often does it get sent out? Stuff like that. Uh, so just recapping the setup. So I have an isolated sandbox network. Uh, we've got our router connected to a switch, connected to our access point, and we've got our vacuum cleaner wirelessly connected to the access point. Uh, we also have just another computer that's just spamming out random identifiable information just to see if it's actually capturing and forwarding that off. Um, I did a capture for about a month, just leaving the device on doing whatever it wants to do. And then I also did a bit of a more interactive capture to so actually sending it commands to see how it responds to that. Uh, we also had to filter out network noise because my network stuff like spamming out DHCP discovery protocol stuff everywhere. Um, and then just to compare how the old version's network activity differs to the new version's network activity. Um, so looking at the network behavior, um, what we see here is a bit of a graph, I guess. Um, the key is anything purple is kind of low, anything more to the red side is kind of high. Um, and what you can clearly see just at this point in time is that at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., depending on time zone, um, there's some elevated amount of activity. And this is quite consistent between the different versions. Um, so we can see that something is happening at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., who knows, whatever. Um, what exactly? We'll look into that in a second. Um, so in terms of some endpoints that should be, I guess, noted at the time, there's M2, which is the MQTT server. So this is just polling, stuff like that. Uh, A2, which is our outbound request. So when the device needs to make a query, um, and this awsde0.fds.api.xiaomi.com, uh, which is the logging 
where it dumps all the logs into. Um, so just looking at where is this data actually being sent to? Um, it's mainly the US and Germany, um, but these are both just AWS servers. So I'm not too concerned that it's like sending off to a random party. It's just AWS um, and AWS will kind of propagate and duplicate its data everywhere anyway. Um, but that's just for us to know, I guess. Uh, now looking at the traffic, there is a whole heap of DHCP and discovery packets. So I just filtered those out immediately because they're just local. Um, and as I talked about before, there's connections to uh, America, Germany, and China. Um, for this China servers, there was the Xiaomi cloud, but it was actually, uh, I guess, decommissioned when I was checking because every time it made a request, it got like an error of 400. Um, so I was ignoring that as well. Um, so as we mentioned that at 3 a.m., there was increased activity. Um, and it just so happens that 12 a.m. is, well, 3 a.m. in Australia is 12 a.m. in Beijing. So it's likely that there's just some sort of schedule, I'm assuming some cron tab, some service, um, so at midnight every time in China or in Beijing that it will try to reach out. Um, looking more into it, uh, it actually just appears that the increased connection is just because it's reconnecting to everything. So it just turns out that every 24 hours, it kind of just restarts itself and then connects. Um, and then just looking at some changes, just keeping aware of the time, um, is that the new firmware just uses a new endpoint and it no longer polls the um, decommissioned servers, so it just reduced that network traffic there. Um, so what's inside of this packet? Uh, most, if not all, of the communications were encrypted. Um, and so how do I actually read the information? Um, a, I could break the encryption, but that's way too much effort. So uh, what most people do these days is they just try to look before the data gets encrypted or after it gets decrypted. Um, so what we can do is just create a hooking function that just kind of broadcasts and repeats information somewhere. Um, convert that, compile it into assembly, and then just inject that into all of the function hooks. Um, so that's what I did. And we can also just look at the logs because for some reason, like pretty much everything gets logged out um, into text file, which eventually gets uploaded. So we can just look at those logs before it gets encrypted and sent off. Um, cool. So just a few things to note over, not too important, but just this is what the um, MQT connections look like. Uh, there's just a request to get the status and the device would just say, hey, this is my battery, this is my state, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is my fan power, so on and so forth. And in terms of the device control, um, this is what the robot vacuum cleaner would actually make an outbound request. It would just say, hey, is there any changes since this previous time? And the response would just be like, nah, there's no change. Okay, there's no change in your device configuration, whatever. Um, looking at what gets uploaded. So anything inside of these paths here get uploaded. Um, and we can just verify that by looking at the actual uh, logging compression and encryption loops. Um, so pretty much all the app logs, all the updated logs, this black box statistics, as well as the network dumps here. Um, and just encapsulating all that together is just kind of a network map just to consolidate everything. So our vacuum cleaner, how they work together is that there's a central brain, I guess, called app proxy. Uh, and it just instructs all of these different processes. Uh, you don't need to really understand any of this, uh, but it just tells devices to do things. They respond, they tell app proxy, app proxy tells something else to upload it. Um, that's how it works all internally. Um, okay, so very quickly, just demos and proof of concepts for some things. Um, so remote access, I've talked about how you can get access into things. So I just have a demonstration here. I won't show it though, uh, but we can get access to remotely control the device. I could give it to someone else and then I can still access it on their home network. Uh, what this means is that I could use their robot vacuum cleaner as a jump host to see other things that they're doing around the house because it's basically just a like, you know, it's a computer in someone else's house owned by you. Uh, reset persistence. So talking about, you know, what happens if I modify the factory restore partition, I could plant stuff like that. Um, therefore, if someone else has it, you know, even if they reset the device, I will still have, you know, possibly remote access from the previous exploit as well. Um, and finally, upgrade persistence. So thinking about upgrading the device, if I try to, you know, let's say, um, we'll do an upgrade, all of my changes from, you know, the current version will be lost because um, how this actual upgrade process works is that it downloads the latest firmware to some device, uh, to some partition, sorry. 
it flashes one of the backup partitions, it boots into the backup partition, it flashes the other backup partition, it boots into that one. Um, and so pretty much if we did have any changes, we'd lose it. Um, and it wouldn't be affected by our reset persistence, um, I guess, exploit, uh, just because it's not using any of the data there. Um, so one way that we could possibly propose how to actually achieve this upgrade persistence is to kind of um, interrupt how it does the upgrade process. So when it does do the upgrading process, um, it extracts all the information to this update buffer. So if we have the ability to modify the contents inside the buffer, or perhaps modify the program that does the extraction, uh, we could potentially inject our own malicious stuff or just add something inside there. Um, and such that when it does do the flashing, it will contain the modified data, um, such that the changes propagate. So very quickly, how do we do that? We either uh, update this sys update binary, so we just binary patch it to say, hey, do these extra instructions. Um, or we could just spam a whole lot of repeated cron tabs just to continually try to echo or cat something into the partition. Uh, probably not a good idea because your CPU usage will go all the way up, um, but possibly there. Um, and so just thinking, what would you want to modify if we wanted to do this sort of persistent, uh, upgrade persistent modification? Probably we want to insert our own user, modify the ADB binary, give us access to SSH, uh, probably give us a backdoor, modify IP tables. Uh, for the fun of it, we could change the sounds that it makes, um, which is, I guess, probably from the uh, Michael Reeves Roomba sort of YouTube video. You probably want to change the sound of when it bumps into things, when it boots, who knows? Um, and you'd also have to make sure to patch the device for future upgrades, um, such that putting in the previous changes uh, doesn't get lost when you do another upgrade. Um, and the last sort of uh, last sort of proof of concept is um, over the air routing. So with all of these previous you know ways to get into the device, uh, it relies on the fact that I have physically opened the device, gotten out that shell, sorry, uh, the hardware to find the pins and then do a UART access, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that takes like at least three hours. And if you're a bad person, you probably don't have those three hours, um, especially if you just have the device for a few seconds. Um, so one way that we could is uh, could get access is over the air, right? Because as if I don't need to touch the device, even the better. Um, so one way we could do it is by over the air, as I just said. Um, during the device initialization, we can actually send an update packets or whatever you want to call it um, to tell it to download some random file, extract it, and then execute the script. Um, unfortunately, this was patched a long time ago, um, I think in 2019 November, so about six months after the device was first released. So probably no one has this um, vulnerability on their device, uh, but it is worth mentioning just because um, for those you know people who did have that device, they'd probably be selling it off to get a new version. I um, mean, so whoever buys it off then would be vulnerable to this sort of attack. Um, and what we kind of see here is how did they patch it? Um, is that they detected that it says, if they receive the payload that says, hey, do an update, they just, instead of doing the update, they included another check that just says, okay, print, and then just discard the thing. Um, so no one else is vulnerable to that. Okay, so that's pretty much all I did for Thesis C. Um, now, kind of bringing it all together, um, talking about threats, so something that Richard wanted to hammer on last time, um, I hopefully finally addressed with these things. Um, so the, I guess, threat scenarios or threat models that we're talking about um, really is with, uh, okay, well, there are four kind of big threat scenarios. One is that there is no actual threat. It's more of a just, I'm a consumer, I paid for this device, why can't I do this? Or, you know, what is being done with the data that it should be mine? Um, the other threat scenario is what we might call a proximal threat, a uh, physical proximal threat. So someone with access to the device for a either a prolonged amount of time um, or just a short amount of time, such as the supply chain or a secondhand seller, uh, what could they do with it? Um, the next threat scenario is a remote proximal threat. So someone who's nearby, either connected to the network or kind of just snooping the network, but not actually connected to the network. Um, and then we've got our final threat scenario, which is a remote access. So either some bad person doing a backdoor or, you know, the vendor themselves. So we don't know if they have a command and control server and stuff like that. Um, what we're excluding, just to make sure and just putting that out there, is we're not talking about the data that's being used in the cloud. That's an entire other thesis that I'm sure someone else would do in the future. Um, okay, so talking about 
the fact that there might not be a malicious threat, but the still the threat is about the data visibility and ownership. So how do I know what data is actually being collected? Uh, we know that from the privacy policy, which clearly didn't actually match uh, what was actually happening, you know, you can't really trust that privacy policy. So how do I know what data is actually being collected? Um, you know, in order to do this, you do need to have some sort of equipment, the skills and the willingness to actually open up the device, touch electronics, not get short circuited, stuff like that. Um, the patience to unscrew a lot of screws. Um, yep, that's an important thing. And just the fact that data is encrypted means that you either need to know how to, you know, decrypt the data or you need to know how to subvert the encryption. Um, then other question is how, or can I even control the data that is being collected uh, remotely or locally? There are a few projects to actually, I guess, uh, disconnect this robot vacuum cleaner and other models as well from the internet. Um, so, you know, effort has been done from the community in that. Um, and, and also how can I confirm that my data has actually been deleted? Uh, this is a big thing because, you know, looking at the actual account deletion thing, and just keeping in mind that when we disassociate the device, it doesn't actually delete the data. Um, can we really confirm that the data actually gets deleted when we press delete? Um, yes, also this slide here. So um, recently BMW, not recently, actually two years ago, they also mentioned it. Um, they started selling their heated seats as a subscription, which is kind of funny because you know you pay for the hardware, you have the heater in your car, but you got to pay extra money in order to actually use it, which is really weird. Um, so how do we know that, you know, this device is still mine even after a few years? Are they going to add a paywall to say, hey, to clean, you know, an extra six minutes of your house, um, you know, you need to pay more and other things like that. So can I modify my device? Um, the device data is encrypted, the logs are encrypted and, you know, all the ways to access the device are actually restricted. Um, so can I modify if I don't know what I'm doing? Probably not. If I do know what I'm doing, you know, there are a lot of stepping stones and hurdles to actually get access into the device. Um, apart from that, yes, you can kind of modify the device. Uh, so talking about actual threats now. Um, so the friend who has your Wi-Fi password, even though you didn't give it to them. Um, so in terms of physical and proximal threats, um, for someone who has, you know, extended durations of time to actually access it, um, there is a restriction that, you know, they need to unscrew it, they need to get access to the shell, they need to get the password, all that sorts of things. Um, but to a supply chain who might be doing it maliciously, that's probably nothing for them. Um, what they could do is extract any potential user device um, data, app data, your wireless configurations, your map data, some things like that. Or they could modify your device to, you know, later exploit um, something in your house or your network. So adding persistence, remote access, using your device as a jump host, or, you know, doing a TCP dump and eavesdropping on your home network. Now, for someone who has, you know, just a few minutes or even a few seconds to access your device, there's not really a lot that they can actually do just because all of the attack vectors are pretty much restricted. Um, with ADB, we saw that there was a proof of concept before how I can execute any random command. Uh, but in order to do that, I first need to get the root password. And in order to get the root password, you still need to do the entire pull apart the device sorts of things. So there's no fast way, which is actually a good thing. Um, and with this reset and over the air routing thing, only devices that are pre November 2019 are affected. So most people will be pretty safe from that. Uh, moving on to our third scenario, which is the coffee shop hacker. So someone who's just nearby, uh, you don't really want them listening, but they're just there. So the good things is that all data is encrypted, um, not just on a TLS as a cell level, but um, Inside of each of the applications, there is another level of encryption. So they all use some sort of AES RSA public encryption scheme, uh, which is good because if someone is snooping um, using a man in the middle, stuff like that, uh, there's still another layer that they have to break. Um, IP version 6 is blocked in the update, so no one can just start SSHing remotely. Um, and speaking of SSH, the server is blocked by default. I don't think it's even running when it starts unless it needs to, um, but we don't know about the other services. So that could be future work for um, next time. Um, and then OTA routing, it is patched in 2019, but anyone pre-2019 would be vulnerable. Although I expect that like no one would really be doing a device initialization in a coffee shop. Um, but I say coffee shop, you know, it could be anywhere. So someone who's just sitting outside your house, you know, they could be potentially sending in these malicious payloads to change your device to get access to like that. Um, and again, if you were trying to pair it um, just from this previous picture that anyone who 
can see the network. Since the network is an open, um, unencrypted wireless network, anyone can see these packets just being flown around over the internet, not internet, over the air. Um, and so if they were there at that specific point in time when you pair the device, uh, they'd be able to see your wireless password and credentials there. And our final threat is just the vendor and other people who are backdooring. So all of these are kind of like warning signs or just not ticks or crosses because we don't really know what a vendor might do with it. Um, I don't want to go to any conclusions as to if they're malicious or not, uh, but just things to keep in mind is that they do have access to your user and device data. They do have the ability to remote um, to remotely issue commands. Uh, they do have the ability to remotely packet log, uh, potentially do future executions of remote commands. Uh, that is a duplicate, whoops. Um, and also just the fact that their privacy policy doesn't really match up with what we expected. Uh, that is a question there. Um, and now as for other threats as well, you know, if I buy this device, how do I know it's not backdoor? There's really no telltale signs that a device is modified. Uh, we don't know if, you know, this device is doing more than it says it's doing or less. Um, and the fact that everything is running as root means that, you know, just a simple or just a single vulnerability would give you root access to uh, the device. Okay, so privacy and security response. So talking about, I guess, bringing it back to the question of, you know, how have manufacturers actually addressed these issues? Um, certain things from this specific manufacturer is we have seen that they have tried to actually prevent buffer overflows and just all these basic checks, I guess. Um, but on the broader scale of things, uh, scheme of things, they have, you know, decided to put application level encryption. And that's a pretty big thing because um, relying on TLS, um, SSL alone isn't a very secure way to think about things um, because, you know, being able to undo those things is actually very simple from a hacker point of view, I guess. Um, so the fact that they've put thought and effort and to actually put in each and sing each and every program in their pro in their system um, is a good move on them um, in the future upgrades that they've done they have reduced the log verbosities um, although it's not consistent because some of the programs still spit up literally every line including the passwords um, yeah they've added ip tables and ip6 tables rules they've tightened the adb ssh and serial access methods um, and they sort of seem to respond to security incidents. Um, I want to mention on that later. Um, and some effort to uphold and to define the usage of the data. Um, so I say seem to respond um, to security incidents because when we actually look at the website, there's only one vulnerability disclosed, uh, which is kind of interesting because they've been running for about eight years and they have 15 different products. Um, and the fact that they have only one vulnerability means that they either have really good programmers or they're just not telling us. Um, so there are perhaps more, but they're just not really telling us. And that's kind of hard to really give them a reputation as being good or not, um, just because we don't have that transparency in you know what they are doing, if they're even getting vulnerabilities, stuff like that. Um, in terms of other companies, you know, other companies have so many more, you know, published uh, records of just issues and ways to fix it. So, for example, Xiaomi, um, a look, looking at the CVE database, there's at least 79 of them as opposed to just the one. And from the previous vulnerability, they didn't really mention anything to actually say, here's a CVE that you can reproduce or anything. Um, it's not necessary, but it is kind of good for that overall company image. Um, so some questions though to think is why do these companies have it and not the previous one? Um, these companies are much bigger since they are kind of a vendor of the products, they're selling it to other people to use. Um, so there is more at stake for them to have a higher level or higher image of security um, compared just to a smaller um, manufacturer or a smaller vendor. Um, so it kind of does make sense. Um, but in terms of what these companies are also doing, um, as I mentioned before, they do have their own white papers. In fact, they have their own security teams um, about talking about you know security and how we need to kind of centralize that sort of security, not centralized, but just um, collectively think about security um, as a team and not just put it as you know a side thought. Um, so yeah, the two-year paper mentions stuff about encrypting during the pairing process. Um, but as I've shown before, just with the plain text, the vacuum cleaner actually doesn't do that. Um, so, you know, a big question to ask is if there is actually any compliance checks or verifications between the manufacturer and people who implement the manufacturer's equipment, uh, we don't really know. Uh, okay, so our final point is towards an expected conversation. Um, so in 2000 and I think 19 or 2020, um, a 
kind of protocol was published by Cisco um, and it's called the Manufacture Usage Description. Um, and basically, this is a way for devices to advertise their expected network traffic behavior. Uh, for example, saying that, hey, um, I should transmit you know, some packet over TCP 8890 uh, to example.com. Um, if the network switch detects that you're transmitting to something that's not in the whitelist, it will just drop the packet. Otherwise, it will allow you to actually send it over. Um, and the IoT research team at UNSW, part of the electrical engineering department, um, they have actually done some research on this, uh, which is good. So this idea is great and all, except um, we don't really see it being used out in the public. Um, despite the fact that there are, what, 7 billion enterprise IoT devices, 25% breach from IoT devices, and a security incident costs about $3.6 million, uh, despite all this, we really haven't seen anyone use it um, other than Cisco themselves. And even within the Cisco lines of products, only one of the actual product ranges actually implements it. Um, so it's a big question as to, you know, why aren't companies doing this? Is there a reason because it's too much effort, stuff like that? Um, or is it just not worth it um, or there's no real need for it? Um, so I have created some what we call MUD profiles, MUD, um, for the actual device. So if it ever becomes a popular thing, hopefully, you know, we can get that sort of um, transparency and sort of whitelisting of what should be expected. So uh, why would you actually use this? It would prevent someone from doing malicious things such that if I'm trying to, you know, access a service or device because of a backdoor, um, that isn't intended, the switch or the network will say, hey, I don't recognize this. This doesn't look like what you should be doing. I'm just going to cancel it and drop it for you. Um, cool. So uh, wrapping up, how have manufacturers of IoT smart home devices addressed the increasing concerns of digital privacy and product security? Um, so data is cleared during resets, which is a good thing, and they have been locking down on their access methods. So um, over ADB, serial, and SSH, um, and they've discarded the use of the Mi OTA, and also they prevented IP version 6 access. And they've also been encrypting data during transit, which is a good thing. Uh, but of course, there is more to be done. So further transparency in disclosures is pretty much a big thing in terms of reputation. Um, probably fixing up their privacy policy to actually reflect or better represent what they want from the user. Um, encrypting the process of pairing. Um, that's probably a very big red flag because the fact that they're using another manufacturer's stuff, who says that this is what needs to be done and they're not doing it. Um, yeah. Data should be cleared on device disassociation. So when you actually delete the device from your account, uh, it should just clear all the data because like, why would you, why would you remove the device unless, you know, you no longer want it. Um, and then a better coordination between ecosystems and vendors. So what I was talking about between the pairing encryption thing, um, using the MUD, manufacturer usage descriptions, both devices as well as the actual network infrastructure. So other brands and vendors of network switches, routers, they should also be implementing this if it is a good thing, right? Um, and finally, just white papers and bug bounties um, are always a good way to, I guess, entice people to actually or to promote doing research onto this sort of security fields um, of IoT. Um, okay, so thesis in a year, I think overall it's been a very interesting experience, um, you know, learning and kind of just hacking into things from the convenience of my house. Um, it has been quite lonely, I guess, because, you know, there's not a lot of, I guess, uh, communication. Um, but over the terms, I think it's been very beneficial just learning a lot of different ways to I guess, think about security and also just learning about different avenues and about how IoT, how manufacturers and how other sorts of, you know, big companies have been working together or not working together uh, to deal with security. Uh, so I guess just closing up as final thank yous. Um, thank you to Richard and Lachlan just for supervising slash giving help. Um, thanks to Lisa for organizing things, I guess. Um, thanks to my parents for giving me food. And thanks to all my other friends who have joined today just to listen to me rant for about an hour. Cool. Thank you. Yes. Well done, Andrew. Um, does anyone want to, I've got a whole lot of questions for you, but does anyone else want to ask a question quickly? Some people probably have to leave.
Just wait another second, just in case anyone's got a question. You can go first. Uh, I can see Andrew and Ryan are typing. Hey, Ryan. Um, Lachlan, I guess you've got questions too. Do you want to? Do you want to go first, or do you want to go second, or what do you want to do? Um, I only had two um, questions. I only had two questions. I think that'll be quick ones. Think so that'll I be quick ones. So I might just jump in quickly if that works with you. Yep. Um, um, first of all, Andrew. First of all, awesome. Andrew. Uh, awesome. Great presentation. Uh, great project. Really amazed to see what you've done with the whole thing. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just confirming that the the 2019 privacy policy is still their most up to date one. They haven't published a newer one since then. Um, there is a updated version on the Roborock website, but that one talks about the email privacy and not the actual device um, thing. So this privacy policy, which I extracted, was from the smartphone application, uh, which is the most related thing to the actual device communications. Um, so I would be inclined to say it is the most um, up to date version. Yeah, okay, very interesting. Good distinction. Thank you. Um, um, the only other question I had is I think you mentioned uh, at one point that you were considering sort of notifying the vendor of findings or things that you found. Is that like, do you think you'll go forward and do that or have you started to do that already? Uh, I haven't done anything yet just because I'm trying to finish up writing the thesis. Um, but I think just letting them know and saying, hey, I found this sort of thing. Um, it doesn't really affect many people or there's a very niche case, but it is still an issue. So you should probably go and fix it. Um, so I think that is in my roadmap of things to do. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was it from me. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Lachlan. That were great questions. Um, I was going to ask about the um, disclosure and re related to that, Andrew, are you going to have on your website, it sounds like you've got some resources there. Are you going to make it in some way a persistent packageable thing that other people can go and learn about? what you've done and other people interested in yeah. doing investigations. Yeah. Oops. Feedback. Um, so oh, I have feedback. a website that I've just been putting all my stuff on. Um, right now it's just a mumble jumble mess of just notes and ramblings. Um, I will eventually kind of consolidate it just so it's more easy to digest. Um, and I won't be publishing the um, exploit until, you know, everything's okay with them. Um, but everything here is just kind of just like, public information of stuff that I found um, that hopefully isn't incriminating or um, exploiting anything that I shouldn't be doing. So yeah, this is this should be public right now. That's excellent. Thank you. I think it's really good to share with the wider community. So everything you can do to do that and to publicize that and to organize it so it's easy for people to access is a, is a really great thing you're doing for the community. Um, so super quick questions. First of all, yes. I should remember this from yes. Peter's eight, but I don't. Um, when you got the password and you had to XOR it with 7 or 37 or whatever, um, was that your idea or that was just someone else? I mean, interested to know how it seems quite arbitrary to, to work that out. Yeah. You, so Was that already known? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I would be inclined um, to I would be ask inclined the other to person who ask also the other person who also the feedback um yeah so the other researcher dennis he actually discovered that thing um and i've actually been doing this kind of entire thesis independently of him um there are certain parts in the actual research from like oh wow i found this big thing and then i go and google and then i found out that he actually did it as well I'm like oh okay probably should have just copied him um but yeah he definitely so the, probably that was only one of the two things that i actually took inspiration from him um, of how to actually get around um yeah so doing that x of Hex 37 was his idea, uh, but then everything else kind of was just independently of me doing it and then finding out that we had similar results. Uh, so I guess like a verification study without copying him. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Well done. Make sure in your thesis when you write up, you clearly flag, don't use modest language or vague language, clearly flag when you did something yourself yeah. and, and when you yeah. the, the two things you accessed. Dennis's insights from because um, even if he's done it, I, don't, I mean, I don't care if he's done it. If you've been able to do it cold, that's really impressive. Um, the, who found about um, when you found that in thesis two that the logger was able to unblock um, port 22, was that from you doing a disassembly or was that uh, again something discovered in the community? Uh, that was me, which was also discovered, but yeah. Um... I put my own effort to find that out. Excellent. Well done. Cool. cool. Um, and then racing through, uh, you're talking about the, the manifest. 
manufacturer can access the map data potentially. Yeah. And you yep. said that's okay. I wonder why you said that's okay. Uh, I said that's okay in the idea of you know um, the fact that it's for uh, diagnostic information. So if you're a manufacturer trying to figure out why is my robot like. You know, let's say you have a robot that's trying to turn left or right. Why is it not turning left or right? You know, maybe there's an issue with or some sort of condition where in the map information, it can't decide what to do. So it just does nothing. Um, so that was my sort of idea behind why it's OK. Um, of course, there's always the issue that, you know, now that they have your map data, what can they do to maliciously, you know, screw you over? Um, but I'm thinking more from a diagnostic point of view, since that's what it's originally intended for. Um, it's probably more just to try to figure out if there are any bugs or flaws in the code um, that they can use the map information to kind of reconstruct the scenario to figure out uh, what's the appropriate course of action to actually perform. Thank you. Yeah, it could possibly get the Zoolander virus and not be able to turn left uh, and that would help them detect it, I guess. And the so I think what you're saying then by that's okay is that's plausible. It's plausible they could need that. That's not ridiculous information plausible, to yeah. have. Um, plausible, yeah. But if you put your um, other hat on, it's actually um, potentially worrying information that they have for a plausible reason. Um, I only say that because I just know, I think you know of the case of one very senior person that has one of these um, that was worried about um, uh, outsiders working out the layout of his house and when he was home and things like that. And so, um, and he had legitimate reasons to worry about that. So, yeah. um, so yeah. worrying, but plausible. Thanks, Andrew. And the privacy policy I thought was very interesting. There's like, that can be remotely updated. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not the same as a privacy policy when you signed up, but you probably never checked. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, they did mention that uh, if there is a there privacy is. policy update that they would notify you. Um, so either I haven't been notified or they haven't changed it. So that's also kind of part of my inference of why it's still there. Yeah. 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 Well, they didn't go to great lengths to notify people. Um, they could probably tell you by getting the robo vacuum cleaner to scratch on the floor, something saying, go to the web page. We've done an update or something. But um, <laughs> other than that, I guess it's easy to lose contact details for people mm. and hard to update mm. them. Um, you said that you did a couple of things when you were observing the network traffic. You just caught logs for a month, and then you did some interactive sort of custom things as well. Um, two parts. One, did you find anything in the monthly thing? And perhaps that was just the frequency of the 3 a.m. Uh, thing. And two was, did you log what you did? I mean, uh, in your thesis, for example, well, is there some sort of log saying I did this, then I did that, and I found this? Or was it more I just fiddled around and at the end I didn't find anything? Yeah, so um, for the unattended stuff, um, I have like 17 gigabytes of network capture activity, um, just of it pretty much polling and doing absolutely nothing like big. So it's just doing a check every like three seconds to say, hi, I'm still active, I'm still connected. Um, so looking at the actual information, looking at the logging information, kind of correlating and interpolating that information, um, what I sort of concluded was that there's no actual information being sent out. Um, and when I did do the more interactive things, oh, sorry, before I talk about that, uh, with the unattended stuff, when it does do the log uploads, which is pretty much um, around every 10 megabytes worth of data, so it does a buffer for 10 megabytes. Once it exceeds that 10 megabytes, it um, compresses it, encrypts it, and sends it off. Um, since we do have access to the log information before it gets sent, uh, we can figure out what it's sending, and all of the actual information is just kind of diagnostic, saying, I'm connected, I got a status update. Um, but there's no actual information that, you know, is of concern um, in that actual information. Um, and then in terms of the interactive logging, um, yeah, I did log down, like, I'm going to do this activity, and then I do the activity and then stop the capture, make a new capture, or just mark it, um, just, just so I can categorize which sections of what part of the um, capture is doing what. Um, and just looking, that was more for an interest, I think, just to look at the like remote connections. Um, but still, there wasn't any like specific um, information actually being logged out. Uh, because from just looking at how the actual code works from the assembly kind of binary level, um, there wasn't really any malicious sort of activity. Um, there was just a large volume of activity because it's all just the logging information all being sent at the same time, uh, rather than just in increments or like bit by bit. It's all just at 3 a.m. That's when it kind of maxes the 10 megabytes and then it just so happens to send out all that information at that time, uh, which is why we had that. Which spike. is why we had that. 
Okay. Yeah. That, that's good. And so I guess um, what was really behind my question was when you write up the thesis, um, it's good if you can demonstrate a sort of systematic engineering sort of approach rather than just I did these ad hoc things. So even if it's I did these ad hoc things and here's how I recorded them or I saying I searched the data and I couldn't find anything is one thing and that's fine. Saying I searched the data by doing these precise things and could and by couldn't find anything I only found, you know, somehow there's this sort of scientific logging approach of not just recording your conclusions, but also providing the data so someone can sanity check what you did or even reproduce it themselves. It might not be possible, but if it is, that just tell it you that's something that's a bit impressive. Uh, and, and then secondly, just I was thinking as you were saying then, um, if there's bazillions of these things being done and, and a megabytes are being sent up, um, it is actually possible sort of steganographically to communicate information. It can be hard to know mm. that there's nothing important. So, mm. for example, I could, when logging, I do have some choice over what I... So, for example, um, presumably the log shows the time that the thing is carried out. So I could say if it's done in an odd-numbered second, I'm transmitting a one, and if it's done in a z an even-numbered second or millisecond or whatever, I'm transmitting a, z a zero, and then each pack, each sniff, each packet or ping or something on the network transmits one bit, and I could slowly leak out something. I mean, not. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I know, but I'm just saying it's always hard to know that no information is being transmitted, especially mm. when there's large volumes of it. Um, yeah, uh, and then. Uh, and then, of course, how the Russians and the Americans deal with that when they transmit information remotely on from each other's nuclear silos as part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, verifying that the, the missile hasn't been launched. They have transmitters in the other silo to send them off, each, you know, willingly. Each lets the other do it as assurance. Um, to stop, the, everyone was worried about these subtle side channels being possible. So they would do something like introduce noise into it, or there were things you could do to stop the other person will make it harder for the mm. other person to put steganographic mm. information. Anyway, we're going down a, a path. But just to say, it is very, it's a bold assertion to say nothing is being transmitted, um, it, just because it can be so hard to think of it. Yeah. You said it's yeah. like um, having a computer in the house. It's a, like having a computer in the house with some unusual sensors. Do you, do you have any, what, what sensors on the device do you think would be of interest to, say, a malicious manufacturer? Yeah, so I'm um, yeah, just thinking so, about. Uh, just thinking. Oh, let's turn off the feedback. Uh, yep. Yeah, um, so the actual sensors on the device, this specific one, um, compared to other devices, um, it doesn't have a actual microphone um, and doesn't have like an actual proper camera. Um, in one of my preliminary readings, um, there was the fact that you could use the lidar sensor to, you know, even though it spins around like at a very slow refresh rate. Well, at a very slow rate, uh, you could potentially use that to map and use it as a makeshift camera because there was a side channel to actually get uh, distance values so you can actually reconstruct a 3D environment. Um, in terms of the actual like device and what you could use the specific sensors on the device, um, so yeah, we've got that camera information and we've got the bump information from all the like wheels and this the sensors that detect if I bumped into a wall um, and because there's no microphone, there's no really auditory response. So really all you can get from this device is uh, looking at, you know, what's around you, uh, perhaps looking at what objects are there in your house, um, looking at the floor map of the house. Um, there's the wireless sensors, of course, so Bluetooth and wireless. So you could detect, you know, what brand of devices, uh, what phone brand, what phone model perhaps, because I know like Apple devices that have beacons that get sent out. Um, so if you can detect those beacons, you'd be like, okay, I have a pretty high confidence that the owner has an Apple device, um, could potentially, you know, send phishing related Apple stuff to them because it would make sense then. Um, and then wireless devices, knowing what other wireless networks there are around you. Um, even though there's no GPS, um, you could kind of um, plot and say, hey, um, around me, there's this specific network called this, there's this network called this. Um, and we know that there are a few projects on the internet where they have someone driving around with a car just to scan the wireless networks around the streets. Uh, so you could potentially kind of like look up and see, hey, where is this actual house? Because there's no GPS on the device, but uh, doing that way of associating the detected networks with the known networks around the neighborhood, uh, you might be, be able to figure out where that location is. Um, what else?
not that, too sure. That's great anyway. That's sure. a really good analysis so far. Keith, are you going to say anything about this in the um, write-up? I wasn't planning on. I wasn't planning on. I could. So. I could. Um, what? You take whatever path you want, but I, I did find that very interesting, but it would be fun if you didn't put it in. Here's one um, crazy thing that I've heard that I've never actually tried to test myself. That um, Does it have a speaker on it? It does have a speaker. It does have a speaker. I have heard, because of the wonders of the reversibility of physics, I mean, I, I know it's true that my speakers can be microphones. I have heard that... Um, it's possible to detect this in hardware and, and turn a speaker into a microphone. I've never tried to do it. Um, but yes, uh, that's again, just we're putting on our tinfoil hats. A and um, yeah, I think from an electrical yeah, from point an of electrical view, because like, I do a lot of sound stuff, like, as, we all, know. Stuff, as um, we all know. You can't um, just turn a, you can't, well, you can just phys turn a, uh, well, you like, can phys uh, physics, um, but just because of how physics, like, um, but just because of processing how, like, things happen, there's like a microprocessor or some sort of um, DAC, so digital analog converter. So that's just going to prevent you from actually going backwards. If you can hardware level wise modify it, then you would be able to, but just with how computers work, these days, computers work really um, these days you can't really do that that's really good to know um and i've always wanted to fiddle with it so mm. that's nice so uh, the mm. DAC acts a bit like a diode that that's that's good to know um and then the um the man in the middle the, is it possible to man in the middle of the upgrade process in some way so presumably it's doing the upgrade with the server, but it doesn't know the server's address, just its name, so that's looked up by DNS, and presumably things aren't signed, or it doesn't have, does it have public, like, is it, is there some possibility there that that could be done? Yeah, so there's definitely a way yeah, so for that to actually be done. Um, that was actually one of the things that I'm going to mention in my future work, um, is the fact that, you know, can I do MITM, uh, man in the middle, um, upgrade attacks, or man in the middle, retrieve the logs or just anything that gets sent to the internet, can I intercept it, then block it? Because um, I know there's a project for, I think, one of the, like, smart plugs, so, you know, you can remotely turn on and off a device. Um, it used a historical connection. So I think what I mentioned previously with the, where is it, this one here, uh, the Mi.io Cloud, um, because they have since, like, actually, like, um, turned it off, the smart plug therefore stops working because it's relying on some control device. Um, so what someone has decided, you know, they got fed up with that. So they implemented like a little proxy server to uh, catch all the requests that device is trying to say, hey, does this work? And then they just send a dummy response, um, allowing the plug to still work. Um, so I guess getting that wireless freedom. Um, so in terms of getting a man in the middle, I think there was um, not from Dennis, but from someone else, um, they tried to look at, hey, can I remotely issue an upgrade? At, uh, not for attacking, but just to actually, uh, the reason why they wanted to do it is so they can extract the encrypted firmware so they can um, analyze it later on. Um, but I'm sure that you could probably, you know, to flip that on its side to actually say, okay, download this file instead. Um, but I didn't actually research that myself. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Look, this was terrific. Uh, did you just uh, what are you most proud of, and did you enjoy doing this process? What am I most most proud of? Um, I think this network graph was interesting. Okay, it's not really the most proud of thing. Um, the most proud thing is probably just playing around the ADB binary. Um, so not because it's like finding your own vulnerability, but just more the I guess research skills of trying to reverse engineer the code, figuring out what's going on on a hardware level as well. Because um, when you're looking at this ADB binary, um, I had to whip out my um, oscilloscope to actually look at the signal levels for stuff like that. Because when you're dealing with USB communications, um, you've got all these signaling things. So it's much more of a hardware related thing, which I guess is more to do with my actual electrical degree rather than just computer science. Um, everything else, in comparison, I guess it was interesting, but yeah, to me, uh, just figuring out that, you know, this was an issue was pretty interesting. Uh, was there another bit of the question? Uh, was there another bit of the question? Uh, what were you most proud of? Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. You know what I'm most proud of? Uh, I'm most proud of that you started, it, that it's a whole problem. It's not some little toy fragment of a problem. You started with this thing that you had to start with a screwdriver. You had no idea if you're going to succeed or fail. You had no idea of where you'd go at any point. At one point, you got locked out and you had to get back in and you bloody got back in. 
Um, uh, oh, I didn't ask. I was going to ask a bit more about how you got back in, but maybe talk more about that in, in the thesis because we're so tight for time. But just, I'm just proud of you for sticking with it. It must have seemed impossible at times or hard to know what to do. Always prompts to cause procrastination for me. Um, but somehow you you powered on and and credit to you. And you've got some results. You've achieved. You've had success uh, in a real whole entire project. And that it, it might not look much to you now you've done it, it probably all just feels obvious. But from the other point, you know, from the looking at it from the other way, entering it, it would have all seemed incredibly hard. So well done. I'm extremely proud of you and what you've achieved. And I'm sure Lachlan feels the same. Um, perhaps everyone could just give you a, a really appropriately loud um, uh, a round of applause. I'll just take my headphones off. I'll just take my headphones off. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Did you have anything you wanted to ask us before you go now and do all the remaining things you need? I've to got do another assignment to do first. I've got another assignment to do first. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, um, is there I, any way we can help uh, you with anything I, or things you want to know? I think just report structure. I think just report structure. Um, I think Should we have a meeting. Set up um, a meeting think, and let's go over the report with you. You know, bring along whatever you've done and we'll give you comments on it. Yeah, we can leave that after yeah, today. Yeah, we can leave that after today. All right, wonderful. Thank you to everyone else who's come. It's so nice of you. Josh and Yunsa, uh, <laughs> you guys are legends. Lachlan, you, you're always helping and helping former students. It's, I'm very proud of you all. To everyone that's come and supporting your friend, um, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and what a great job he's done. Please, everyone, pat him on the back for me. See you, everyone. Good work, Andrew. Good work, Andrew. Well done. Well done.